alternative. Thank you, thank you. Please continue. Yes, um, the longest sustainable alternative news source in the United States. We can put that out there. We are the longest. Free Press from 1970 without interruption has presented alternative uh, news and a progressive analysis of what uh, we know as news. Um, so we, we thought that it would be very important to be part of the discussion that's out there, of the different realities of what budgeting is, you know, the process, the policy, the values, all that, that um, a budget represents. We, we were gonna start with some announcements. Um, so um, I don't know, I have not seen um, if anybody from Simple Living is on yet, but I saw Brian jump on and Brian had an announcement about a fundraiser. So Brian, could you do a quick uh, explanation and we'll probably have you on again later, but can you sort of give your mm -hmm. uh, announcement now about what you were gonna ask about? Or, or oh, talk oh yeah, about? Um, so WCRS, they are going to be doing a fundraiser I think the date tentatively for right now is August 28th. And that will be, that's tentatively going to be at Double Happiness in the Brewery District. And some of our DJs will be performing sets there. Um, details are, final details are still going on. But um, WCRS fundraiser in person, Saturday, August 28th unless we get locked down again. Yeah, with that Delta and Lambda and all those other uh, fraternities that are starting to cause us problems. No, I'm, I'm teasing about the fraternity stuff. I'm just, <laughs> just Don't fly Delta Airlines. That's how you avoid it. Oh, there Never you go, it. Delta Airlines. That's what you got to talk about, okay. Um, and I just saw Kathy jump on. Did you, do you want to do a quick announcement about the garden tour? And if, if you wanted to a little bit later as well, we'll, we'll probably have more announcements. Um, but at the beginning, would you want to talk please about the garden? Are you ready to do that, please? Kathy Cowan Becker. She's the Simply Living uh, ED, current ED. Are you able to do that now, Kathy, or no? Okay, let's uh, we'll move on, huh? Thanks, Kathy, you're, you're splitting up a little bit. Uh, apologies, no, um, I'll have to get to a regular computer in a bit. Okay, we'll, talk, we'll do it a little bit later then, thank you. This, thank you. This is Chuck. Okay, so, so WCRS and WGRN are our sister and brother and cousin and all the other uh, media, uh, the, all the, the other pronouns that you want to talk Husband about. Husband and wife. Yes, all of them. Um, these are our, our, our media uh, sisters and, and, and we want to really understand that Columbus Institute for Contemporary Journalism, which is the host for all this, we are trying to create an ongoing public people, people's public media center. And, and system and network and WGRN, WCRS, all those are much, much, much part of it. So thank you again, Brian, for announcing that fundraiser and please support as you can. Um, Mark, um, this is Tim. Yes, Tim. Uh, Tim Chavez. Mm -hmm. I'd like to make an announcement. Uh, Julie Whitney Scott, uh, a producer for uh, 941 WGRN is currently in her ninth annual uh, Columbus Black Theater Festival. So it's July 9th to the 11th, which is uh, started yesterday and is continuing till tomorrow. So uh, there's still tickets available. So you can go to mindforgodproductions.com and uh, be able to look up what, what's on schedule and what can be purchased as far as viewing the uh, theater. Yeah, so I just wanted to put that announcement out there. Thank it's you, in Tom. Dublin, Dublin, Ohio. Thank you. Yeah, we'll do more announcements later at the end. So the folks that come in later that we'll get we'll get more announcements. So, and and I'll remember all those that are thank you, Tim. Thank you very much. Uh, Jamie is coming on too. All right. 
Um, I don't know if you know about rethinking schools, but rethinking schools, this, this particular issue was from spring 2021, but the issues are dynamic. They're, they're progressive educators across the country. They're based in Chicago. Um, I encourage folks to start thinking about possibly uh, supporting this, uh, this, this brand. Um, this one right now is how to teach about uh, disability and what is, what is, what is justice, you know, uh, for folks that are experiencing that have living through a disability and what does that actually mean for a lot of folks. So, um, so that's, that's one thing. So uh, we're talking about budget tonight, budgeting, right? Uh, the city budget is policy. It exhibits priority and it exhibits what are values, right? Um, whenever you're dealing with public policy, you will have conflicting values, right? So we need to always understand that there will always be conflict uh, when we're dealing with budgets. And we should rejoice in that because we're going to be a minority voice so often that we need to understand that being in conflict makes change in policy possible, okay? And so what we're hoping to do tonight is to talk very forthrightly about uh, budgeting and what does that mean, okay? And uh, we'll get more into it as, as our speakers and our guests talk. Uh, this is the city budget. And these are all the yucky yucks that sign off on every budget. Um, you know, the, the, big, the big dude is Andy right here. Um, I'm hoping to have a dunk, 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 uh, dunk booth uh, in the next two, three weeks and, and invited him to be part of it. So hopefully he'll, he'll be a good humored person and be part of that. So if he does, I, I'll invite everybody to bring a softball with you. Okay. All right. Um, one thing I did want to start off with a very historic and not historic in that it's never happened before, but Haiti. Um, the assassination of their president uh, this week uh, is very, very disturbing if you're a progressive. And um, I just want you to know that we need to be very conscious that, that uh, this assassination was done. Uh, the dude named, I mean, there's accounts that the guy said, this is a DEA uh, 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 operation. And that's why no one shot back because they thought it was the U.S. coming in to help. But no, they came in to kill the, 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 the past president and tried to kill his wife. So um, the, the politics by assassination has always been bad for the left, always been bad for progressive movements. We need to really pay attention to Haiti in these next months. I mean, Haiti has always been a hotspot. It was the first, the first uh, nation state or island or whatever you want to call it that resisted slavery. It showed us the way towards the future. Hopefully this is not showing us the way of the next future of politics by assassination. The 60s showed us that we were losers in that. And so hopefully this is not the direction that we're going. But please, if you need more information on it, if you don't know what I'm talking about, contact uh, Black Alliance for Peace. Now, I, I don't wanna keep Dr. Uh, uh, Fidel Kaboob uh, uh, too uh, uh, committed all day long, but um, he is with the Denison University. My sister went there for two years. So I love Denison. I hope I spelled it right. Did I spell it right? No, nope. yeah, close enough to it. Yeah. All right. Uh, but he's uh, Department of Ed Economics. And he comes to us with, um, he's very well known for a theory. No, that he did. didn't spell it right. Okay, well, it's close. Oh, I, yeah, Dennis Shun. I forgot the I. I put too many I's in. I'm sorry. I was trying to make sure I didn't put too many N's in. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I should correct that. But anyways, um, sorry. 
So uh, yeah, so uh, doctor, you you go ahead, do your your thing, and we'll we'll have more uh, presentation as we can in the future. Uh, I'm gonna unshare, so if you need to share, you can share some things as well. Thank you for coming with us tonight right. and walk us through the the uh, modern monetary theory that you are so well known about, but also uh, anything else you'd like to bring to us, please. Well, thank you for, uh, uh, can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you for um, organizing this and for having me. I'm, I'm going to try not to take too much time and make this uh, too formal. I'll just share my screen for, for just one second to share with you what the MMT perspective uh, is, is all about. And MMT is short for Modern Monetary Theory. And you may have heard uh, discussions about MMT and, and policy circles in the last couple of years, uh, especially with the discussions around how to pay for the Green New Deal, how to pay for Medicare for All, how to engage on these massive you know, infrastructure and spending programs that the mainstream of the economics profession and the mainstream of politics tells us that it's going to bankrupt the country, it's going to cause inflation, maybe even hyperinflation, and you hear the whole thing about Zimbabwe and, you know, Weimar Republic and we're, we're borrowing too much from China, the, the whole thing. So here's what MMT is about in, in a brief kind of discussion. Um, the first concept that MMT reminds us of is that the federal government is not behaving financially in the same way that your city governments or your household budget behaves. In other words, you and I, cities and municipalities and states, we are currency users. We're the users of the dollar. We're not the issuers of the currency. The issuer of the currency is the US federal government. So that's point number one, which means you and I have to work hard, earn an income first in order to spend. We can borrow from a bank or from a friend in order to spend beyond our income. But once we do that, we have a debt. We have a financial burden that must be paid at some point in the future by spending less or earning more money or both, right? That is true for you, for, for me, for states and municipalities and so on, everybody who's a currency user. For the federal government, the federal government has the capacity to spend beyond its um, quote unquote tax revenues. So that's observation number one. That doesn't mean that we're saying that the federal government has unlimited infinite capacity to spend and that there is no consequences whatsoever. That is absolutely not true. MMT is very clear about the real limits to federal government spending. And this is why I'm sharing my screen here to show you these, these limits. So the mainstream of the profession tells us what the limits of federal spending is whatever we can collect in taxes plus whatever we can borrow. Right? That's, the, that's the real limit. Otherwise, it's going to cause inflation, hyperinflation. MMT simply tells us that there is this large, bright yellow additional spending capacity that we're not tapping into. And that bright yellow space is not infinite. As you can see, it's limited by this red bar right here, which is the inflation risk. That's the real limit to how much we can spend on health and education and infrastructure and everything. So what determines the risk of inflation? This is really the focus of MMT or modern monetary theory. It's, it's two things. One is the lack of productive capacity. In other words, when the country literally runs out of productive capacity, that is machinery, technology, skilled labor, resources, physical resources. If we run out of those physical resources and we still spend more, then yes, we will cause inflation. Now, the good news about that risk of inflation is that productive capacity is producible with strategic investments in infrastructure and, and health and education. We can produce more skills. We can produce more hospitals. We can produce more engineering capacity and so on, you know, within the physical, biophysical limits, obviously. So that's the good news on that front. We're not really constrained financially. We're constrained in terms of real resources. The second risk that determines the risk of inflation is where I think we should focus most of our attention at this point, because this is, this is where it gets political. 
And that is what, what I call the abusive market power and abusive price setting behavior that some key players in the economy uh, inflict on the rest of us. Think of big pharma, think of your uh, internet providers who can constantly increase your broadband um, you know, subscription every other month and, and you have no choice, there's no competition. So we're talking about you know, abusive corporate power. And that kind of inflation risk, these guys who can raise prices simply because they can or because we let them, because they're not regulated, that kind of risk of inflation, we can't eliminate it by spending less on health or less on education or less on infrastructure. It's got nothing to do with it. The only way to mitigate that risk of inflation is by taxing and regulating their market power out of existence. In other words, the 535 people we sent to DC their job, we call them lawmakers, we call them regulators, their job is to tackle this market power. And here's what happens if we are able to successfully do that. In other words, if we invest strategically to increase productive capacity in areas where we have shortages, and if we tax and regulate aggressively enough to democratize the market, then what happens to this picture, that bright yellow space gets even bigger because we're pushing the risk of inflation further and further out. And as a result, liberating more fiscal spending capacity for a Green New Deal, for Medicare for all, for infrastructure, for whatever the country deems a national priority, right? And to me, that second part there, the abuse of market power and, and corporate, this is, this is corruption. This is what we mean by saying taking money out of politics because the 535 people we sent to DC, this is supposedly a government of the people, by the people, for the people, not a government of the super PACs for big pharma and big oil. So MMT kind of shines a bright light on the real constraints that the economy faces. And a lot of them have to do with, with power and corruption and shows that there's plenty of possibilities and that the lack of resources is not lack of financial resources. It's shortages of strategic resources in key areas. I'll give you one example just to illustrate. Let's say we all agree today that dental care is a human right and that every person in this country has the right to it and the federal government's gonna pay for it. Pick up the phone tomorrow and call your dentist and schedule your appointment, everybody. So I pick up the phone and call and they say, sure, we'll be happy to take you. The next available appointment is January 20, uh, you know, 33, because we don't have enough dentists and dental hygienists to serve the entire population immediately. We have a shortage of productive capacity, skilled labor and so on. But then they say, well, if you really need to be seen next Wednesday, we have this premium gold platinum membership, $10,000 a year, and we can get you in next Wednesday. So without building the productive capacity and without taxing and regulating the abusive market power in particular industries, we're not getting the prosperity that we, that we deserve. So that's one of the key observations about MMT. So uh, if I have one more minute, I'll just highlight some what I call some of the goals, which is decoupling federal spending from taxation. As I said, again, this is not your state or local municipal budget where we have to tax this to pay for that. MMT says the federal government doesn't need to tax a particular thing in order to pay for it. And this is something that many of our progressive friends really fail to recognize uh, much to our demise, I think, politically speaking. And here's the thing, MMT is not saying don't tax the rich, don't tax polluters, don't tax Wall Street, tax the hell out of them. You know, tax pollution because we want to decarbonize, tax Wall Street to reduce speculation, tax the oligarchs to protect democracy from oligarchy, to reduce their market power, their influence in politics and so on. Those are very important reasons to tax the rich, the polluters, the speculators and gamblers and, and so on. But that has nothing to do with paying for national priorities. The federal government pays for national priorities based on what we need and then worries about the risk of inflation and in the way that I described earlier. So we decouple the taxation from spending and we've done it before. The federal government does it all the time, especially if there is war funding, especially if there is COVID relief funding, 
we know that there is no shortage of money. When, when the COVID, um, um, when the CARES Act was passed, 100% unanimous vote. Who did we tax? Who did we borrow from? Nobody, right? Whereas when it comes to other spending programs, we say, well, where are you going to get the money? We can't borrow it from China. We can't borrow it from, well, who are we going to tax? So this is really extremely important as, a, as part of our political agenda to recognize that the real constraints are physical productive capacity constraints and abusive market power constraints. They're not about finding the money because it's not like a city budget or a municipal budget where you have to find you know, tax revenues somewhere to pay for it. Uh, and once we do that, we in the United States in, in particular, I'm happy to talk about other countries, developing countries in particular, it's, it gets more complicated with developing countries. Once we understand that, then we understand we can afford universal public services as step number one, meaning green infrastructure, Medicare for all, housing for all, education for all, childcare, all of these things we can afford them in the United States. The second layer of the MMT policy implications is a federal job guarantee for people who want to work at decent wages and benefits and, and so on. And then the third layer that we in the United States can afford is a generous income support for people who can't work for health reasons or, or otherwise. Uh, so this is really kind of a, a quick summary of, uh, of the policy uh, platform. And then just to highlight this, and I'll stop here, um, why in the Green New Deal framework in particular, we insist, I repeat, we insist on include, including healthcare, education, housing, and energy, energy and transportation investments, because these are currently the actual sources of inflation. When I say currently pre this COVID situation, right, which I think it's transitory. So the sources of inflation in the US are healthcare because of shortage of productive capacity and because of abusive market power by pharmaceuticals and hospital systems and so on. That's why we need Medicare for all as part of the Green New Deal, not as a, as a nice add-on. Education, uh, college and vocational training for all, another major source of inflation in the US in the last decade at least. Housing, that's why homes guarantee and rent control and taxing and regulating market power in the real estate industry is part of the Green New Deal agenda. It's not a nice add-on, it's a key feature because those are the components that will allow us to increase the productive capacity and also tax and regulate the abusive power in those industries. And naturally oil and gas and transportation industry, uh, I, it's, it's kind of the core feature of the Green New Deal to decarbonize the system. So my point here is that all of these things are not the, the favorite shopping list of the progressive movement that we put into the Green New Deal. They're there for strategic reasons in order to actually introduce this national prosperity program without causing inflation, without bankrupting the country. You can't separate the spending on the priorities from taxing and regulating abusive corporate power. This, this has to be part of economic and political agenda. For, for the movement. And I'll, I'll leave it here, uh, and I'm happy to answer questions uh, as needed. Thank, Thank you, you, Fadel. Uh, I, I entertain now, uh, uh, clarific we will entertain clarification questions first, but I do, uh, just to, to warm up people, how does MTT, MMT um, define infrastructure? That's the big, uh, that's a big discussion in DC right now. And, and sure. how would how would MMT join that conversation? So I, I wouldn't say that MMT as kind of the, the modern monetary theory kind of uh, academics have a, their own definition of infrastructure. I'll give you my definition of infrastructure. Okay, um, please. Uh, it's traditional infrastructure, but with the green component because we can't afford to repeat the mistakes of the last several decades. Uh, uh, trees are infrastructure, uh, broadband is infrastructure, people are infrastructure, uh, and I'll give you a specific example um, as to why this is important. So let's say we're going to spend, making this up, making up numbers, $50 billion on 
green infrastructure across the country, right? We're going to put solar panels and wind turbines. And we say, this is the priority and maybe broadband and whatever it is. So now we're hiring workers, paying them decent wages. They get that income and they're going to go out and spend it. It's a free country. They buy whatever they want. They want to buy a house. They want to buy a car. They want to buy clothing, entertainment, whatever it is. So MMT doesn't focus just on that initial spending. MMT focuses on what will be the second and third wave of spending. For example, if we notice, and we can plan this in advance, obviously, I mean, this is the, the key insight of MMT. We know that people are gonna spend money on entertainment and housing and food and transportation, and they will need childcare, right? So not having enough productive capacity for health, for childcare, means now this spending is going to feed into a price increase and an exclusive type of services for childcare. That's why we insist on the $50 billion that we're spending, instead of spending all of it on solar and wind turbines, maybe we spend 45 on solar and wind and dedicate $5 billion to increasing productive capacity in childcare or in whatever area there will be shortage in. Maybe we need to tax and regulate abusive pricing behavior in that particular industry. And that's how we can afford to spend more without causing inflation. So to answer your question about what is infrastructure, yes, the infrastructure is the solar panels and wind turbines, but in order to make this doable, we have to build the additional human infrastructure for childcare, for healthcare, for education, for transportation. All of it is part of the same infrastructure spending. Otherwise, the infrastructure spending in the narrowest sense of the term will be inflationary because it's not transformative. Because it's just building stuff without changing how the rest of the money will trickle through the system and affect other sectors. Thank you, thank you. Any other questions that are sort of uh, um, needing clarification of what the, the professor talked about, Fidel talked about? Um, anybody at this point? Um, I will post a few links here in the chat if people are interested in thank you, you know, following thank you. up later. Yeah, MMT has been uh, a gaining a support and energy uh, among the progressive voices. It, it was brought in a few years ago, and some folks were skeptical. You know that there was, uh, but a, a, a great example of 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 MMT is um, in the area that is Iraq and Iran and um, the independence and, and Turkey, uh, that area uh, where, where uh, they're wanting an independent land and uh, MMT has sort of taken on a role. Do you want to discuss a little bit about that area? Uh, and I don't want to name them. Uh, you can name them as you'd like to. Uh, I actually don't know what you're referring to. Oh, so okay, okay. Tell me more. Um, <laughs> yeah, but they, they they took on they took on a local local uh, uh, process of, of budgeting and really have really tried to redefine uh, budgeting on on a, a, the MMT theory, the theory of modern monetarism. Um, if, yeah. If any, any other? If you have any references, Mark, please uh, send it my way up because I, I haven't. Sure, seen sure, anything sure, really. sure, sure. Um, anybody have any other questions or answers uh, that would like to be shared at this point? If not, we can move towards. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Anybody? Yeah, that. Yes, Charles. Charles is. <laughs> I didn't want to name it, but Kurds. The Kurds are the Kurdistan. Have, have really taken on MMT as, as one of their, their uh, agenda items of how to project um, budgeting and policy uh, in that area. Um, anybody have any qualifying or uh, clarifying questions? Any other input that may uh, be talked about? Any challenges, any, any, any uh, uh, interest in talking more about <laughs> the, the, the MMT at this point. Uh, if not, we can move 
uh, to Joe in a minute, uh, and we'll have more discussion. Are you okay to stay on a little bit more as as we warm up this conversation? Sure. Absolutely. Sure. Okay, fantastic. Thank Charlotte you. Charlotte always has a question in chat. So is the biggest problem the political power of oil and gas and big pharma, et cetera? I think it's it's part of it, but it, but there's also, you know, uh, the, the dominance of, of the mainstream economic approach of the of the neoliberal approach. I mean, these ideas of, um, you know, sound finance principles are deeply engraved in, in everybody's mind, uh, including progressives. Um, you know, even progressives today um, who are not part of the, the MMT uh, movement and approach uh, tend to sort of argue that, yes, we should spend more on infrastructure today and everything, but we can't really afford all of these things at once. And maybe we should do it really quickly now while interest rates are low because the cost of borrowing is low, as if the federal government needs to borrow its own money. Um, so I think it's it's beyond just the power of the oil and gas companies and, and big pharma and so on. Uh, it, it has to do with, you know, progressives themselves not truly understanding what the spending capacity of the federal government is. Uh, but it's changing slowly. Uh, some of you may have heard uh, Congressman John Yarmouth uh, of Kentucky uh, a couple of weeks ago um, being interviewed on, on C-SPAN about he's the chair of the of the budget committee and he completely understood and referred directly to MMT um, in terms of how we're going to pay for uh, the infrastructure program why is it not uh, going to bankrupt the country he answered all the questions live on TV and he was very clear that his understanding of federal finances was based on MMT he referred to Stephanie Kelton's book the deficit myth which I highly recommend if you haven't uh, read it yet. It's on the New York Times bestselling list for the last several months. Um, so um, I think it's, it's, it's beyond just the power of corporations. Even people who have all the good intentions are still stuck in the old ideas that we need to live within our means. We need to be careful. And they connect taxing, it, taxing oil and gas companies to funding the Green New Deal which I think is, is really a dangerous idea. And I'll tell you why. If we say it's to tax them because they need their money to pay for the Green New Deal, then by definition, logically, we're saying we need those powerful oligarchs to be even richer, which means more powerful, so we can tax a little bit of their money to have a more generous Green New Deal. It's just shooting ourselves in the foot. Let's tax the hell out of them, tax them out of existence, because we need to decarbonize, not because we need their money or their permission to fund a Green New Deal, to have health care, or to have whatever national priorities we want. So that's what I mean by decoupling the taxing function from the spending function of the federal government. If we keep linking them, we're going to live within the same framework within which we operate at the city level. We have to tax somebody or borrow from somebody in order to build the school, right? There's no other option, right? which means you're limited by your tax base and you're dependent on the rich to fund your infrastructure, your education, or your health and whatever. And as Stephanie Kelton uh, famously said, money doesn't grow on rich people. <laughs> the federal government has the power of the purse, yeah. right? And so, how did so to work? get... Right, can you imagine if before World War II, we waited to tax the rich or borrow from the rich. World War II came right after the Great Depression, the most miserable time in US history. There was no money to be taxed. There was no money to be borrowed in the US or internationally. The Great Depression was global. How did we pay for the most expensive war in the history of the US, World War II? The power of the purse. The federal government spent money into existence to pay for the war. Can you imagine if we said, let's go uh, you know, fight the Nazis, let's send them 10,000 troops every other week and see if we can scare them, see if we can win this thing? Of course you can't, right? It was massive spending at once. Where did the money come from? The power of the purse. What did we worry about during that war? Do we have the productive capacity? How can we produce enough tanks and airplanes and, and how can we marshal the physical resources 
That's why we shut down the city of Detroit. That's why we imposed restrictions on the use of rubber and key materials that we needed for the war. And that's why during the war, not before the war, during the war, we increased taxes and the federal government started selling war bonds. War bonds were not there to finance the war. The war was already financed. It was already paid for. War bonds were there for the workers who were building the tanks and airplanes to postpone their consumption during the war because we didn't have new houses for them or new cars for them. We gave them wages and then we begged them to postpone their consumption until after the war. So we sold them war bonds and we promised to pay them back plus interest after the war. That's how we managed inflation by managing the real resources that we needed for the war. And that's how the federal government always spends. We don't borrow and tax in order to pay for wars or pay for anything. They just introduce this idea and kind of feed it to the public all the time, especially when it comes to paying for health or education or supporting the most vulnerable people in society or fighting climate change. They say, oh, now we don't have money. Who are we gonna tax? Who are we gonna borrow from? We can't afford to borrow more from China. All of that nonsense. So MMT yeah. just blows all of these myths. So Kathy has a question and Stephen has his hand up. Maybe that's the reason you have your hand up. But she, you, you're mainly speaking of, and MMT has mainly thought about federal budgeting. Right. Kathy asks the question, can or is there a way to, to translate that to a local level at all? Um, yes, there is. Um, and and, I, and I'm, I'm happy to share this um, with, with you. But it, it does require some bold uh, leadership at the local level. So when the federal government abdicates its power of the purse, in other words, refuses to spend on the national priorities for health and education infrastructure, like they did during the, the beginning of, of, of the pandemic. You remember what Mitch McConnell told states and told them, go file for bankruptcy, you blue states, right? The federal government is not gonna help you. Um, what can cities do? Cities can issue complementary currencies, local community currencies. Mm -hmm. and, and there's thousands of them around the world. Nonprofit organizations, doesn't even have to be a city, can issue complementary community currencies. And I'll give you an example in Argentina during the crisis in the early 2000s, during their Great Depression, they managed to get out of the Great Depression because of a complementary currency. So it's a federal system, one of the states didn't literally didn't have money to pay the police officers, the doctors, nurses, and teachers, and there was riots in the streets and so on. And then they figured out a way to do it with the local currency. The state told its employees, we're gonna pay you 70% of your wages in the national currency and 30% in this new currency. They even called it the coupons, like a voucher. They called them patecones at the time. So they said, what do we do with this funny money? They said, oh, you can use this complementary currency to pay your phone bills, your utility bills, water, electric, gas, whatever it is. And don't worry, we already talked to the utility companies. They agreed to accept this for payments. So their employees, I said, fine, if we can pay bills with this, that's, that's good enough for us. And the state, of course, made an agreement with the utilities because now the utilities are allowed to pay their taxes to the state with the same complementary currency. So the money goes from the state to the employees, employees pay their utility bills, utility companies pay taxes back to the state, the issuer of that complementary currency. And that's the quick circuit. All of a sudden people were able to pay bills. Within a matter of days, all major supermarkets and all local stores started posting signs at the door. We accept patecones, one-to-one -one exchange rate. Why? Because the supermarkets also have employees who pay utility bills. The supermarkets themselves pay utilities. So within a matter of days, the recession was over, the Great Depression was over, the state was able to issue the complementary currency, pay its employees, employees pay their bills, other people can use it to pay their bills as well. And that's when Argentina rediscovered its monetary sovereignty. They said, well, wait a minute, why are we doing this with funny money? We're a sovereign country, we can issue our own currency. That's when they broke away from the IMF deal which constrained the government of Argentina at the time from creating its own currency. 
the, the currency board agreement that the IMF imposed on Argentina at the time in the 90s was literally restricting how much money the country of Argentina can actually legally issue within its own borders, its own national currency. So that's when they canceled, they got rid of the currency board and they said, well, we can spend as much money as we want. It's, it's our national currency. And, and that's when they introduced the job guarantee program, the, the KFS program, which employed 2 million people within a matter of months and, and really turned things around in, in Argentina. And that's when they also defaulted on the IMF loans and, and so on. So there are examples of successful complementary currencies, but it does take bold leadership at the city level and it does take mutual agreement, right? Because it's a system of trust. Any currency system is a system of trust. So you have to have the utility companies on board, some of the key supermarkets on board, and you can literally jumpstart a city in the middle of a recession, in the middle of a depression, uh, yeah. which by the yeah. way, we did in the US during the Great Depression, right? Yeah. There was local currencies all over the place um, in, uh, in, in this country. Uh, and yeah. when they became a danger to the sovereignty, the monetary sovereignty of the United States, FDR banned them and introduced a new deal as the new initiative to revive the US economy. Um, so that's how dangerous they are because they can be effective actually. But when the federal government abdicates its capacity to fix things, communities can take matters into their own hands. Thank you, thank you. So Charlotte asks about uh, the biggest problem is uh, uh, the political power of the big pharma and uh, gas and oil. You spoke a little bit about not needing to worry about them too much because the, really the theory is we're not dependent on that. We're not dependent on their their contribution to society in whatever what what either positive negative whatever it is. Can you speak a little bit about that the political power balance the balance of power that may need to be altered a little bit uh, or a, a great deal transformed uh, uh, if MMT would come through. So I didn't mean we shouldn't worry about them. If anything, I should okay. think we, should, we should worry about them the most because they're, yes. they're the real, they're hijacked the federal government, essentially. Yes, we have yes, super yes. Tax, You know, setting the national priorities for us, we don't have a democracy, right? Yeah. But what I meant is decoupling the, the funding part. That is, that is to say, we don't need their money or their permission to start a Green New Deal. We don't need their money or their permission to have healthcare for all, right? When, whereas their narrative, the dominant narrative says, yes, you do our, need our money because you need to tax somebody to get that money to pay for healthcare, right? And that's how they constrain the system. They say, well, you can't tax us more than X to fund your generous Green New Deal or your generous healthcare for all or, or whatever. So I'm saying, let's separate the two. Let's fund the national priorities first and let's tax the hell out of them, tax them out of existence, decarbonize the system, reduce the power and influence of the oligarchs. Those are reduce inequality. Those are very important reasons to tax, but we shouldn't say we need to tax them to have a Green New Deal. Otherwise we can't have a Green New Deal because we will not have their money, right? It's very important to separate the two. And Thank if we you. don't, yeah, that, then, then they're, in the, they're in the driver's seat. Right. Yeah. And they convince congressmen and senators and, and people in, in, in the White House that without our money, without taxing us, without borrowing from us, you will not have your infrastructure. You will not have this. So you need to do whatever it takes to make us wealthier, more prosperous, to grow our businesses so that we can contribute to your social welfare system. That is the trap. So they need to be in the trailer, but not in the driver's seat. Absolutely. <laughs> um, Steven, did you see anything else that we may need to, I saw your hand was up that you, did I touch on most of what you were talk, uh, wanting to bring in? Uh, I was gonna say uh, federal discounts to corporations are like a reverse MMT, but that's <laughs> maybe going a little too far. <laughs> Yes. What, what you're saying is, is true. You know, we're not saying that MMT is a thing that we need to apply. MMT is just describing how the system works. It is working for 
the interest of the corporations. What we're saying is that in a democracy, if we believe in a democracy, it should be a government of the people, <laughs> by the people, for the people, not for the corporate interest, not for the tax cut, not for big oil and, and big pharma. Um, you know, Dick Cheney understood this, right? He said, <laughs> deficits don't matter. Reagan proved this. Um, even what's his name, the, the conservative radio uh, guy? That just away. passed. Yeah. yeah. Rush Limbaugh. Rush Limbaugh. Last year he said, of Rush. course we understand MMT. We've been doing it this, this whole time for, conser for the conservative agenda. It's just the Democrats who don't get it. You know? <laughs> Thank you. Um, Charles mentions FDR called the gold to keep it from competing with sovereign currency, also called in gold. So we're not based on gold anymore. So what 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 is the how does MMT deal with the all this new currency that's out there? What, what, what's going on? What's going on? There is no new currency out there. You're talking about Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. Those are those are speculative investments. They're not mm -hmm. money. They're not currency in the traditional sense of the term. Yeah. Um, yeah. So th that's the MMT position in, in three seconds. But to, mm -hmm. to go back to FDR, one of the most important things that we did during the New Deal era that many people forget are the PICORA investigations. Without the PICORA investigations, there would have been no New Deal. There would have been no um, you know, uh, golden, golden age, so to speak, for, for the US economy. The PICORA investigations did essentially what I was describing here. It's going after the corrupt corporate oligarchical power. And, and if, for those of you who are not familiar with the PICORA investigations, I highly recommend listening to a new podcast series uh, that Bill Black and, and other colleagues have put together in the last few months. It's called The New Untouchables. Uh, check it out. It's a massive uh, source of information that you know draws your attention to what the PICORA investigations did in the 1930s to go after corporate power and to demonstrate essentially that we today will not have a Green New Deal, will not have Medicare for all unless we have, we can't have a new deal without having a clean deal. When you have corporate power dominating the system so much with corruption, we're not going to have the, the system that we, that we need. So highly mm -hmm. recommend it. It's called the New Untouchables podcast. Thank you. The New Untouchables. It, it send that to the Charlotte, we, we, or to the chat, please, uh, because we do save our chat and we'll send that out as well uh, as the recording of this uh, event will be going out, uh, Stephen and, and Susan. Suzanne was the link in the chat. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to start moving towards city uh, involvement. And Joe has been very involved in the city project called Columbus, Ohio. Um, and uh, thank you, Professor Fidel, Kalouk, for your, your, your leadership, national leadership on the MMT and, and your, your gracious involvement with us. <laughs> Um, for us to, a lot of us have heard, uh, you know, many, many of our people are DSA folks and many of our people are, you know, other folks. Um, so we've heard MMT for many years, and, but we wanted to definitely include that in our discussion of what would be a people's budget and the process that we're going to take to develop that, that, that thought. Um, it's not it's not a one and done issue. Um, we have to be always in there. And, and Joe is a perfect example of always being in there. Oh, there you go. That's the next generation right there. Thanks for, thanks for uh, joining us. Thanks for, who is that? Who is that? That's my littlest one. He's two and a half. This is Jalil. Say hi, Jalil. <laughs> hey, Denise. Good to see you, man. Thanks for lending your dad out tonight. Okay, thank you very much. We'll get we'll 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 release him soon. Okay, we'll release him soon. So, Joe, please uh, start telling us a little bit about uh, the city, please. Okay. Well, last month Mark tasked me with uh, putting together a budget as to what I would consider priorities with our American Rescue Plan dollars that we uh, received, and. 
uh, if you know if I'm going to run for mayor in a couple of years, I figured this would be a pretty good exercise for me to start creating a budget. <laughs> so, so, and I'd also want to note that you know, of course, if I was mayor, I would be advising, getting advice from my uh, directors, as was shown uh, on that budget sheet by Mark at the very beginning of tonight's meeting. Uh, probably I'd be using the advice of a lot of people on this call as opposed to a lot of the bureaucrats that are currently sitting uh, down there in Mayor Ginther's uh, offices, but maybe a couple of them. Okay, so first of all, I just want to, you know, give a little breakdown in terms of the money that's being allocated. And this is federal money, American Rescue Plan dollars, and there was $350 billion distributed, $195 billion went to the states, and it's distributed on a each state's share of unemployed people after an initial allotment of $500 million per state. 65 billion went to counties, distributed based on each county's share of the general population. 65 billion to municipalities, distributed using the Community develop, the Development Block Grant formula, which uh, considers a variety of measures largely focused on population poverty and house overcrowding. 20 billion went to tribal governments, and 4.5 billion went to US territories. Half is being distributed equally and the other half based on population. Here in Columbus, we are receiving 187 million and the county actually is receiving 225 million. Only half of that's being distributed at a time. So right now, uh, the city of Columbus does have half of that 187 million. They have already decided to spend 19.7 million of the city's funds and it's been earmarked for youth and summer safety youth programs. Some of you may have heard uh, Mayor Ginther's uh, press release on that, on the news about that. So we have a, basically the city has $167 million remaining and, uh, and the county has their 225. And, and I'll, after I'm done speaking, uh, both of them are taking uh, public suggestions in terms of how you would like to see that money spent. And I'll give you the email addresses and such for that. There's also going to be a county public hearing this Thursday at 396 South High in the commissioner's hearing room and also a Zoom. You can uh, get on Zoom as well and you can have public input in terms of uh, how you feel that money should be spent. So my budget out of that 167 remaining do million dollars, uh, I'm suggesting that 60 million of it be allocated for affordable housing uh, for those with incomes of 60% AMI or lower, and that's about $35,200 and below. And I want people to know too that I have already requested a, a written a letter to the Columbus Partnership um, asking them to match that $60 million. And now that I know the amount that the county has gotten, X actually was just announced, uh, I read it in the paper today, uh, I am also going to suggest to the county that they match it with $60 million. So we're talking about $180 million, I think that could be, uh, that put a really big uh, help into uh, impacting our affordable housing crisis. 170 million remaining, um, because statistics prove that uh, what we all expected that COVID really impacted the low income and people of color the most. And, and I would hope that most people agree that big business and corporations don't need another nickel of this money. Uh, I think that me medical and mental health uh, should receive about $15 million. And because Adam H plans with and funds and evaluates about 35 different county agencies, uh, I think regardless of what you think about Adam H and how they do distribute that money, that they would probably serve as the best source to, di to uh, distribute these funds. And I'd also like to hear uh, other ideas for that, of course. And there should be a mechanism created for other smaller nonprofits who are typically left out of such funding uh, for mental health due to their not being players in our city's nonprofit pool of revenue. I think so, a lot of you probably are familiar with certain nonprofit organizations that aren't part of the club that uh, a lot of times aren't receiving uh, uh, city and, and county dollars and they really have to fight like hell in order to get them. So we have to make sure that uh, they also have access to this money. Eviction assistance and utilities, in January, $26.8 million was awarded to Columbus for rent utility assistance. Already in 2021, we've had 5,000 evictions filed. Now, I do not know how much of that $26.8 million has been used. 
Uh, but if it has dried up or is close to drying up and it needs to be replenished, uh, some of these funds need to be used. So I really have a sense that additional funding is really going to be needed regardless. So I am, my thought is to put at least $20 million towards eviction assistance and utilities again to further, further that amount. Economic development for uh, small businesses in distressed and uh, disadvantaged neighborhoods, I have marked down for $15 million. We, I think we all know where those neighborhoods are, the Hilltop, Linden, far south sides, far east sides, you know, and the, those neighborhoods. We know where it's not needed, where we're getting, where it's, you know, also you, can, you can hear the sucking sound of our tax dollars going into the Franklin area and other, you know, in the short north downtown. And, you know, you hear the same cries about, you know, Columbus, this is, I have to say this because I keep reading it again and again, and many of you have heard this, a dying downtown is going to be a dying city. So we got to keep pumping more and more money into downtown Columbus, or we're going to have a dying city. You know, we have to pump money into downtown Columbus. There's no doubt about it, but I really kind of get tired of hearing how much that sucking sound goes into downtown Columbus too. So we got to start looking out as, you know, for the, you know, our other uh, urban and core uh, neighborhoods. Job placement, I have listed for $5 million grants to such organizations such as the Columbus Urban League, uh, Impact Columbus, Salvation Army, COWIC, Alvis House. There's, there's a number of them. Uh, again, a lot of, I think that, you know, in, due to what COVID did and the impact that it had on our unemployment and so forth, uh, we need to make sure that we can provide uh, job opportunities for those people that, uh, you know, that were really hurt by COVID and such. Food banks. Uh, I have down for $10 million. Everybody knows the food banks, uh, they're, they're being just swamped by not just people in the city, but in the suburbs. So that again, uh, we need to start, we need to put some of this money into our food banks. I also have about $4 million towards our cultural arts. As many of you know, musicians, artists and such, they were really hit hard uh, by COVID in, in terms of, you know, not being able to perform out and make a living. So we have to, you know, us also be concerned about uh, our cultural arts, our musicians, our artists and such. Uh, $10 million towards childcare services, you know, and, and childcare was mentioned previously, the importance of that. I also earmarked $10 million for a one-time emergency cash payment of $500 for 10,000 people. And that would be tied, of course, to uh, income levels, people making under $30,000 and other restrictions that, you know, uh, you know, people from my department would uh, decide on what would be appropriate for that. So out of that, I have $20 million left. So I'm uh, asking everybody on the call and for, uh, you know, my interim department directors that are on this call for your advice in terms of uh, uh, how you feel that $20 million should be spent and any kind of, uh, uh, you know, thoughts you have about some of the, the funding that I uh, decided on. So any clarifying or, or other questions and and Fidel, please uh, throw in your in, input on, you know, your economic background on on what Joe has just mentioned, uh, if you if you don't mind. Um, Kathy in, included that the county is having public hearings. The dispatch has an article on it uh, about uh, residents, Franklin County residents, to throw in their ideas of how they want to spend their money. Um, that that not that free money, but that that's that stimulus, that that money that's about to happen. Kathy, go ahead, talk, please. Uh, yeah, hopefully you can hear me okay now. Um, yeah. So the big need I see for Columbus that I'm not seeing in Joe's budget here is transit. And that is not just Columbus, but also the county and grow in the partnership too. do the same idea that you did with housing. But we need life changing. This is a life changing amount of money. And we need to not just put it in like, you know, daily expenses. Um, Columbus has a really poor public transportation system. And if you look at our climate emissions, our carbon emissions, our emissions from buildings are going down due to energy efficiency and some renewable energy. Our emissions from transit keep going up because people, a lot of a million more people are expected to move here by 2050. And we don't have room on our highways for a million more gas cars. Um, I saw like where Joyce Beatty got some money for transit 
um, from Washington and it's all going to highways. That's not what we need. We need public transit, um, whether it's bus rapid transit, rail, trams, um, and we need a, a, a much better transit system in league with other cities our size. And this would really help, you know, everyday people get to work, get to school, get to, you know, shopping or wherever they need to go. Um, we really need to rethink our public transit system and that is going to be a major investment. And that's the kind of investment we need for this life-changing amount of money coming through the America Rescue Plan. I, I'm not gonna disagree. Thanks, but I'm not 100% sure if this money can be used for that. It does, it does state infrastructure, and that's about as close as it comes, when it, it claims infrastructure, and that's about as close as it comes to maybe indicating that it could be used for transit. So I can't say 100% that it could actually be used for that. But I, yeah, I don't disagree with your comment. Yeah. yeah, that might be a, a discussion within the, 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 the 1.9 or whatever it's going to end up being quote unquote infrastructure stuff that is still not passed. Where uh, Joe's been talking about money that has gone through Congress, has been signed, is legal. There's money there in the bank and there are limitations on the spending. I mean, they talk to us always, city employees, no, we can't spend it on this, but we can spend it on that. Uh, but, you know, and at the end of the year, last year, we, they were throwing money at projects. Uh, but so we need to really, as a progressive community, really get in their face and really start, as Joe does, he gets down there uh, and we need more folks down there doing that of where this money, this this all of a sudden money uh, that, you know, it, it helped because guess what? The city may not recover from uh, downtown employment. The employment may be done. I mean, totally uh, not, but uh, Huntington, uh, uh, nationwide, all those employees that have been working at home may stay at home and not be paying uh, city taxes. Uh, and that revenue may impact down the road. Uh, do you have any any points on that one, Joe, of about the future of of income taxing and and you know they've usually used income taxes like that's their general revenue minus a, a little bit of investment and 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 other uh, uh, revenue that's generated through other things, but uh, income tax is number one as its a source of income. Yeah, it's it's almost 80 percent of the city's budget city income tax so and the, i think the biggest the next biggest one is uh property tax revenue it's only six percent and then it just goes you know everything else is fees and this that and the other so um yeah i mean and and i, I hate to say it but it's the truth that the fact that i gotta jump on my tax abatement bandwagon here uh the city sacrifices property tax revenue because they only get six percent of that for city income tax revenue. And that's why they give away property tax revenue like it's it's Halloween on every Monday. So, uh, you know, again, and in, in it, everybody really needs to pay attention to what's gonna happen downtown because you're absolutely correct. Uh, a lot of these office buildings, uh, you know, fewer workers going downtown, uh, it's gonna hurt small businesses downtown. I mean, you know, it's interesting some of the comments that have been made lately that uh, they, you know, we almost have or do have 10,000 people living downtown now, and they're crying about it still being dead, nothing to do. Where are these 10,000 people spending their money? I mean, you know, where's the businesses downtown? Are they not supporting the businesses downtown? I mean, we always heard, you know, you know the sidewalks rolled up after five o'clock downtown. I mean, are they still doing it, even though we've got more people living there? And if fewer workers are going to go down there, sure, it's going to hurt. I've actually commented to people that I I almost think Nationwide Insurance might sell their building there at Nationwide Boulevard someday. I mean, that's prime location by the convention center. And if this continues, that they're going to have people staying and staying at uh, home to work and such, that's <laughs> that's a prime piece of real estate. I just I have to wonder sometimes with some of the cuts that they've made in their employees and such. And I think that could happen to some other buildings down there. So uh, it's people need to pay attention to what's happening downtown for sure. Yes, thank you, Joe. Um, I see many people starting to talk about things. Uh, 
when he's talking about the alleys and poverty, and, you know, uh, the alleys are really messed up. Yeah, so um, I don't know, Wendy, if you want to talk more about that. I know we're getting sort of late. Uh, Dr. Uh, Fidel, uh, he, he mentions that uh, we need a central trial mayor's uh, effort that might pull together some, some thinking. Do you want to speak a little bit about that? Um, Chuck Lind, we're going to invite you to, to do an announcement on the upcoming garden tour and then uh, some other input that uh, Simply Living has. Uh, Dr. Fidel, uh, he, he, he did um, mention uh, 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 another kind of currency and, and Simply Living has created the Care Share uh, Bank. And, and so if uh, Charles, I mean, uh, Ch Ch Charles, Chuck, if you're ready, are you, are you ever been called a Charles? I wonder. Uh, <laughs> can, Chuck, can you uh, maybe uh, uh, share a little bit with us, please? Well, I want to thank Bottle Kaboob for doing his usual a stellar performance. And I would love to hear more about the mayors because I would love to see the mayors collaborating and not having another million people in Columbus rebuild these mayors, these legacy cities they're called. So uh, yes, I put in the very top of the chat uh, an announcement about the, the Simply Living Sustainable Living Garden Tour, July 24th, 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. We have eight, eight tour stops, including one community garden, which some of you know about Paula Penn Nabrick and her uh, community garden uh, in the east side that's really wonderful. The other stops are mostly in Columbus and one in Worthington. Uh, including North London, Clintonville, one on uh, the, near the old Tangy River. Anyway, some great locations where you can learn and talk directly with the homeowners or the community garden director about uh, how, how these uh, techniques are being used. And it's not just food and pollinator gardens and attractions and, all, and wildflower habitats. And it also has uh, uh, information about homes that have solar panels, homes that have, uh, uh, you'll see EVs, electric cars, and uh, a variety of innovations that, uh, that you can learn about directly from, that's the difference between our sustainable living garden tour and other garden tours that we look and they're great. And many of ours are ornamental gardens as well and are beautiful to experience, include koi ponds and all those waterfalls, cool things. Uh, so I, I put in about my hobby course about horse about the public banking. Uh, it's probably too late to go into that, uh, but if you're interested, go to friendsofpublicbanking.org. I can put that in the chat. Uh, you can review my notice that I put in there about the garden, which has the details about where to, where to get the tickets. You give us 25 bucks instead of $10, you get a free membership in Simply Living and eligible to win. And you have a really good chance of winning because we have a lot of great raffle prizes we're gonna give away. Uh, okay, so I'll, I'll let others talk. But you didn't answer my question. Have you ever been Charles? Oh yeah. A lot of people called me Charlie back in, uh, uh, in college and whatever. My, my right, father always you. called me Charles, but I'm mostly been Chuck. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I I, I meant to call you Chuck, and all, I, all of a sudden I called you Charles for a second. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you very much. Simply Living is is a great partner with many progressive ideas that are going on in Central Ohio, and we need to support Simply Living as much as we can. There is that living, uh, Simply Living and uh, uh, Garden Tour, as Chuck mentioned, Saturday the 24th, 10 to 3. And uh, it's, on the, it's, in the, it's in the chat, uh, a link for that. Um, we do have issues, uh, poverty, racism, um, uh, just in general sociolo sociology that uh, is going to challenge challenge the, the balance of power that is, um, uh, folks call it white supremacy, they call it whatever they want to call it, the banking, the banksters. Um, there's going to be pushback if we start talking about recreating how budget is done on local, state, federal, 
international levels. Um, so uh, we need to organize and we need to be truly, truly uh, uh, in the moment and, and, and visioning where we're heading to the future. So I appreciate all the conversation today. I know we're getting a little late. Uh, I think we touched on all announcements that we had for tonight. Uriah's on to Uriah, Uriah Flynn. She's, she's gonna be our leader, one of our leaders next month uh, to talk about radical nutrition, radical nutrition. She's one, one very vocal and very much organized. Uh, do you, Uriah, have anything you wanna speak about uh, your initial thoughts of way, where you might go with that conversation a little bit uh, uh, next month? Sure, yeah. Um, I guess what we need is the radical access, which we currently don't have. And that's probably the biggest barrier to uh, entry for people to make this shift and shift into a plant-based or plant pure uh, dietary perspective. But it's also goes way beyond what we eat. Um, veganism is an ethic that's based on nonviolence. So um, there's a lot of ways we're violent towards other earthlings besides eating them. So um, the radical nutrition is a great uh, segue into the greater consciousness of veganism. And, and that's my whole thing is helping people understand what veganism is and why it's critical and urgent for humanity to make this shift in consciousness because uh, we're not living in our inherited, our, you know, our grandparents era, you know, 90 years ago, there was only 2 billion people on earth. Now there's nearly eight. And this has created tremendous uh, pressure on all of our ecosystems globally. So transitioning how we live is, is critical because of that alone. So radical nutrition is, is certainly an entry into discussing, you know, what, a component of veganism because it encompasses much more than just what we eat. It's just the most commonly known based on marketing <laughs> from the movement. Thank you, Riot. And more to come in August, more to come in August. Uh, so please join us in August. And uh, everybody is joining the bandwagon for the Multiple, Multiple for Mayor uh, 2023 campaign. Uh, uh, where, where do we sign up? Where do we where do we get the volunteer stuff going on? Uh, start posting that, Joe. Uh, we need to get yard signs, etc. You know, start getting that door to door campaign going on. Uh, Doctor Doctor uh, Fidel, thank you again for sharing your your little man. Thank you. And in yourself, your knowledge. And uh, please continue to uh, do your work and put, put that theory out there. And let's start seeing if we can put some application to that theory across the board here in Columbus, but also around, around the state, around the world. Um, and I'll, I'll put some work, uh, some information out about the Kurds uh, 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 if you haven't heard those before, but um, it's pretty well known uh, their, their use of MMT. Uh, 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 process. Um, anybody, uh, Pat, Mariah, I know you were going to try to catch us up. I know we're getting late, but Pat, would you want to catch us up with any of the down, down General Assembly uh, work that's going on around the uh, HB6, etc.? Pat, Mariah, please. Patricia. I can't get my button unmuted. Uh, you are muted uh, and then you I, I haven't followed the state house too well, except that we know that this the Senate Bill 52 passed, which mm -hmm. is which is the one that uh, deep sixes uh, prevents solar uh, from getting developed in the state of Ohio. And uh, Kathy Kowalski at Midwest Energy News has written a really powerful article uh, about you know what the problems with with all of this. Uh, um, the the actual the, the corruption and and how the government uh, you know how how the state house is is just um, uh, well kind of out of control I suppose you could say so um, House Bill six 
There's no way that the first energy, it's amazing how much power they still have. There's no way they're going to rescind that. Uh, the Sierra Club Beyond Coal people are working hard to get to, to attempt to get the uh, coal uh, uh, provisions rescinded. And um, they, I think they've got an uphill battle, but they sure are working on it. Uh, uh, I don't think the state house, you know, has any interest in that. Uh, um, uh, this year or the rest of this year or any other time. So, um, and then there are a number of the, um, of the protest, uh, uh, anti-protest bills, which just seem to get worse all the time. So I don't know, Kathy Cowan Becker follows a lot of those things more closely than I can. Maybe she has some, uh, some comment on some of those, but you know, they would, um, that if you film a police officer, that is now supposedly, that could be a crime or a felony. So others may chip in here that know more than I do. Thank you, thank you. And your, your involvement with, with a whole anti-nuclear uh, reality that, that, you know, trying to keep the industry, uh, I don't know what the right word is, it's not honest because they're definitely not honest. They're not accountable. Um, they they have perverted democracy in so many different ways. But your your presence and your work down there has really been, uh, and and all the others that are down there as well, has been very very important for the people. And just an example of with 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 a householder getting caught, that would never have happened if there wasn't the scrutiny that you guys were putting on the whole thing in the first place. So they, they would have been able to get away with that uh, very easily. In the past, they were, they did. Uh, but this time they weren't because you guys were keeping the eye on it. Um, thank you again. I won't take credit for those arrests, but- No, no, have, no, no. I mean, we have worked a lot on, you know, uh, on uh, issues at, at um, the Portsmouth nuclear site. And it really yeah. is, as you were saying, it really is the war making industry and the military industrial complex that are sucking the money out of the public and anything nuclear, whether it's so-called civilian or military is all going to be paid for nearly 100% from now on by the public. Uh, and they are, there's a huge plans for expansion of at the Portsmouth nuclear site. They want to make this high and high assay, low enriched uranium. That's 25% of fissionable uranium. And that is uh, uh, a huge proliferation risk and very easily converted to making weapons. And they want to make depleted uranium for warfare down there. So that is not, you know, that's a real problem. And, and uh, some of us organizers are continuing to, uh, that have worked a long time on it. We're continuing to to follow those issues. And Mark, you might want to say something. Is there anything going on for the Hiroshima and Nagasaki uh, uh, commemorations this year? Yes, we, we have a concerts planned for the at the University Baptist Church on Lane Avenue uh, on uh, August 8th at seven o'clock. Uh, Rocco DiPietro De, De and uh, his clan will, will be putting together a great concert um, and uh, we'll be putting that word out uh, very clearly through this community, but August 8th at seven o'clock at the University uh, Baptist Church. Uh, Winnie did want me to clarify uh, something, and, and if she wants to speak for herself, please do, uh, but her issue was not about the ally or alleys. It was more about the, the, the message that the ally, alleys were uh, giving us, is when you see them loading up with uh, whole family treasures. That is meaning that evictions are going on. And we were supposed to be in a moratorium of evictions. That's ending. And we still had major, major uh, evictions going on. The neighborhood that's right where I work, uh, it, it, one of the highest percentage of evictions going on. And we're about to step into a, a moratorium free uh, society uh, where evictions will be uh, going and growing. Uh, and we need to really, as a progressive community, defend 
our, our, our sisters and brothers and cousins and whoever else is out there um, to really, to, to, to try to, as we did with the fight don't freeze back in the end, uh, back in the eighties, when we, we defended uh, folks to not have their utilities cut off in the middle of the winter, we need to understand that uh, the end of, of support, that the financial support that's been going on for COVID, we still haven't recovered uh, economically, uh, employment wise uh, from prior to COVID. Uh, so, Wendy, do you want to speak any more about that? Uh, I, I, I tried to express what you were saying, but if you have a better way of saying it, please. So, yeah, I, I see you. She's on. Yeah, here she comes. She's trying to get on here. Uh, we're about to conclude. Um, Winnie, uh, if you can get on and, and share, if I totally messed that up, please tell me. Uh, the bills to, oh, Charlotte is talking, Charlotte Owens is talking about the, the bills of manufacturers of oil and gas prime, uh, uh, de-icing, dust control are still to be fought. Yeah, we, we, we got many fronts on the large oil and gas and, and other industries that have been very well uh, supported and subsidized by our tax dollars. Okay, Wendy, you're back on. Please, uh, please talk okay. more about what I to say. So Joe is saying that the his uh, suggestion is $750 for people with an income of $35,000 for the family. And that is one and a half times what I'm paying for my mortgage. And and I have three bedrooms in a backyard and a, and a two car garage with a um, door opener. And so the $750, and let me tell you, I worked the census and the um, housing in this neighborhood is the, why well, have a city code if you're gonna let the landlords have un, unsanitary, unsafe conditions with the steps falling apart and the locks not working and, you know, just disgusting. And that, you know, they're just, uh, people are making money off their properties and not providing sanitary um, housing. And the, uh, the fact that we have high infant mortality and high maternal mortality and that we, in, in, the, in that um, Envision Hilltop, it had a little chart of evictions. There was 25% evictions in the Hilltop uh, and they said that was a good year, and that is so. God only knows what it's, you know, what it, what it's going to be um, now after COVID, and it, it just, you know, this oh, unaffordable housing. Did, did you see the article in the Dispatch where they had Mike Primo as an example of someone who would have been um, uh, homeless if he didn't get one of the nationwide healthy homes, and and that is just like. So, to, you know, so neoliberal that he's the face of homelessness. So, <laughs> and so, it's, it just burns me up. Some of those rents, Winnie, I think they are, gotcha. you know, I don't set the rents, of course, but uh, some of those rents, I believe, are in the $600 range, but they don't go any lower than that. I'm pretty sure for uh, the housing that's, and it's kind of like done by CMHA, the Metropolitan Housing decides on those costs. And I believe some of them are in the 600s, but that's about as low as it gets, I believe. And then other, you know, a lot of people receive vouchers to even lower it. And of course, there's like, a, I don't know. So right. Well, I'm on Zoom. No. Yeah, well, that's, you know, that's no. criminal, basically. That's what's causing the uh, high infant mortality and maternal mortality. And city council just doesn't care. And it's on them. And uh, the people, there's already, oh, and, and there's a list of thousands of people waiting on those vouchers. Is, I think a lot of people know that. It's, it's a right. Shame. And that is a fake austerity because they can give away millions of dollars in tax abatements, but they can't give out, they can't give out, uh, you know, they can't find, they can't, they can't have decent rents that people can afford. Yeah, the Housing Now uh, Coalition of, of Central Ohio has been out there that they do have uh, uh, eviction court uh, at the convention center daily and uh, progressive community needs to be out there more and, and really uh, pressing that issue um, much more, especially now that the moratorium is over. 
uh, that that court is going to be coming much more busy than it was before. Uh, I, as again, the, the community I work in, uh, we had the highest percentage of evictions and we are a, 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 a community that has subsidized housing. It's is, is in an ex CMHA project that has been converted to private property now. So uh, again, uh, any any last words from our speakers, uh, Dr. Fidelka Boog? I mean, you 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 are you are like our our think tank uh, for Central Ohio on MMT. Um, Joe, you are our activist down down at City Hall, and we all uh, have our own roles to play. Our leadership within our own community. We do need to really start thinking about the process, the process that a budget comes forward because the outcome is the policy. The policy is the priority. And if we are not in the process, we're gonna be, as they say, if you're not at the table, you're gonna be on the table. And so uh, go ahead, I mean, I saw, uh, Fidel, you, you were starting to get in, so please jump in, please. Yeah, first of all, I wanna applaud all the efforts that many of you and, and other colleagues across the country are trying to do at the local level. Um, but I wanna draw our attention back to the role of the federal government, that many of these issues um, in housing, in uh, infrastructure and, and so on, uh, cannot be addressed only at the local level. Uh, there's responsibility for the federal government. And that's why I posted in the chat earlier a reference to uh, a regional effort. Uh, there's a coalition of 100 plus organizations from Ohio, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, and Kentucky around this effort called Reimagine Appalachia. And the website is reimagineappalachia.org with the blueprint essentially calling on the federal government uh, to do more on decarbonizing the economy, on building broadband infrastructure, on bringing uh, clean, green manufacturing jobs to the region and, and so on. And this is really kind of a mini version of what would be a, a Green New Deal. Um, so one of the things that we've been doing in the last uh, few months is, is getting local mayors from the region to essentially embrace uh, endorse the, the blueprint and calling on the federal government to do the right thing, to fund infrastructure and resources and so on. And would love to have more mayors from central Ohio, um, you know, join this and, and make the statement. Uh, so yes, we can do certain things at the local level, but there is a major, major role, long overdue role for the federal government and bringing us up to speed in terms of infrastructure and, and resources um, at, at the local level. So, so true, thank you, so, so, so true. The, um, the nationwide crisis of housing, the nationwide uh, issue of healthcare, the nationwide uh, uh, divide in education and the nationwide uh, concern for, um, uh, these issues has to be focused on a national policy, a national budget. And that, that's where we're, we, you know, we can pay $3 trillion for a failed war. $3 trillion plus dollars went to Afghanistan and we're pulling out. And the, the same reality when the Soviets moved out is going into play right now. Uh, in Afghanistan. We spent over $3 trillion. We spent about $6 trillion in a recovery plan for or sustainability plan, whatever it is for this COVID thing. Uh, money's there. Money is there. As the doctor said, money's there. Uh, we got to pull. Just to, you know, point our attention to something, because, I mean, the issue of housing, obviously, is a serious issue in, yeah. in Columbus, affordable housing and so on. Look at the last um, congressional election in, 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 in Columbus, Joyce Beatty, Morgan Harper. Look yeah. at how much funding the establishment candidate received from real estate 
uh, sources. And then you'll understand why we have a real estate problem and housing problem in central Ohio. I'll just leave it at that. You know, follow the money. And, and then you'll know why we have a, a housing problem and an affordable housing problem and so on. Yes. So yes, thank you, Amen. thank you. And everybody, and everybody, please, uh, when Suzanne sends out the, the uh, notice of what you missed at Free Press, do try to re-watch re this because there's things probably that were said tonight that went past us real quick. Use that video that we're going to be sending out to to really help us inform our action, our activity. Okay, uh, look at the the shared video, uh, not the, the the chat that uh, is out there. And again, thank you everybody for your joining us in the the salon, Suzanne and and Bob. Thank you for continuing this for so many years and your 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 work over the years have, have, have has really uh, uh, shown us the light of where we need to go. And, and, and really, uh, as a community, we only are stronger as we are all together. So each individual is so important. Please understand that we need, we need all of us. We need everybody. And so take care of each other and, and support each other and, and uh, We'll see each other August, whatever that is, August, uh, what is that? The third, uh, 14th. Too dark. 14th. 14th. Too dark for my old eyes. Um, August 14th uh, will be the, the, the next time. But if you can make it out, August 8th will be the Hiroshima Nagasaki commemoration um, uh, concert. It's always dynamic. If you like uh, 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 music, it, it, it will be dynamic. It's all original compositions. Uh, I'm telling you, these last four years, we, we are just growing in strength with uh, uh, and, 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 and power on that. And next, next month, we're going to do radical nutrition. And that's going to include Uriah on the, on the, on the uh, vegan and other uh, intake kind of approach. But we're also hoping that the the Willoughby's and, uh, and some other folks that are doing uh, 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 community gardening and all that other aspect uh, of how to take control of our community, how to take control of what we are, uh, are offered in our neighborhoods and, and, and other folks. Um, so again, yeah, thank you, uh, Brian, you are so good, you're on it. Don't forget to vote. On August 3rd, what's that? Oh, if you live in the 15th. What's going on, Brian? Uh, the primary to place, Steve Stivers. Oh, that's right. That That's a... Uh, Damn, I quit. gotta go vote. So there's, a, there's a special election going on. Yeah, that's right. And I'm not in the 15th, but yeah, anybody that's living in, the, in, in that so-called district, that I can't call mean. any of them districts because they're, they're all like cookie cutter, or whatever, they're... they're they're created by the powers that be, you know. So, and early voting on the 16th is open now, they said. Okay, thanks, Charlotte. So yeah, vote, vote early and vote often, as they always said, you know, in the Windy City, vote early and vote often. But again, <laughs> thank you, and Stephen, thank you so much for your technical support as usual and always. And again, uh, thank you to the, free press community, you are powerful and let's continue building this people's media center with all the stuff that uh, we have vision for the years uh, here and all the way out. Thank you so much and uh, enjoy the rest of this, this, this month. Joe, thank you for your leadership and and continue and go down there and Joe join Joe sometime when, when there's some hearings. You know, he doesn't need to be the only one down there. 